ora koutou, ko Sylvie toko ingoa. My name is Sylvie. I'm the Chief Evangelist for MyHR and it's my uh, very great pleasure to be co-hosting a webinar today uh, with my colleague Jasmine Holt, who I will introduce shortly. So as you know, today's session is all about recruitment fundamentals, um, attracting candidates to the position, having them uh, be selected and choosing who you're going to offer a role to, and of course the do's and don'ts around managing that process and making sure that it is effective and smooth for your organisation. Um, before we kick off, just a bit of housekeeping, as always, the session will be recorded, so if you um, have to duck away or if you can't stay for the whole time, if there's anything that you would like to revisit afterwards, you'll be able to do so. What will happen is an email will get sent out to um, all of our participants today with a link to the recording and we'll share it on our social media and stuff afterwards as well. Um, that does mean that if you have any questions that you would like to ask, uh, make sure that you ask them anonymously if it's got sensitive information in there. Um, if Jasmine and I see anything come through that has information that looks a bit sensitive, we'll do our best to screen the questions when we get to them. Um, but just be aware that it will be uh, it will be available afterwards. So on the topic of questions, um, recruitment is a dark art. It's certainly not a science. And there's always a lot of discussion that comes up when we're talking about ways to make sure that you're um, getting best bang for your buck with your recruitment processes. So these sessions really come alive when there's a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of questions from the audience. If you'd like to use the question and answer function to ask questions as we go through, you're very welcome to do that. Um, if you'd like to save your questions till the end, that's fine as well. Um, what will happen is we've got about 30 to 35 minutes of presentation content for you today, then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of questions and hopefully let everyone uh, go back to our afternoons at about 10 to 2 is the plan. So that's all the housekeeping as always. Um, what I would like to do though is introduce my colleague Jasmine who will be co-hosting us today. So Jasmine, thanks for joining me. Hi team, it's lovely uh, to be a part of this webinar today. Very excited. Thanks nice. for joining. And Jasmine, um, you and I obviously are both working with customers and with organizations who are recruiting at the moment. Um, thinking about the last few recruitment practices you've been involved in, or recruitment processes, I should say, um, is there one or two things that stand out that would um, help a recruitment process be more likely to be successful? Any kind of key tips that you could share at the start of the session today? Oh, you know, I really think to start with a clear action plan of your recruitment process is key. Um, so before even starting anything, kicking off anything, having a thought out plan um, is always super helpful. Um, when, you know, things don't go so well is when we are rushing and when we don't have that thought out plan, unfortunately. And so it's good if we can take a, a little bit more extra time. Um, I think that will definitely help with a more successful process for sure. Yeah. Nice. What is it? Uh, my partner has a favorite saying, if you if you fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail, you know, so getting that, that prep time and having that plan sorted at the top, I totally agree, is, is helpful for making sure things run smoothly. Um, Jasmine, thank you. Lovely to introduce you to our, our participants today. Um, Jasmine will join again about halfway through to take over half of the session from me. Um, but for now, what I will do is I will share my screen and we can kick off into, into our content for today. So bear with me for two seconds. Nice. Very cool. So the HR fundamental session today is with myself and Jasmine. Like I said, it will be recorded and um, you're welcome to take notes or um, ask us questions as we go through. So the first thing we'll talk about uh, with today's session is we'll talk about headwinds. Um, it's important to understand the context that we're all dealing with, particularly as we're all um, trying to recruit in, in the same market, essentially, with the same kind of economic conditions. So we'll spend a bit of time there. We'll then talk about, as Jasmine has alluded to, defining the role and the importance of knowing what it is that you are looking for before you go shopping for someone. I'll talk about attraction, increasing the pool of candidates for applying for your role, as well as the selection process for choosing your candidates. Jazz will take over and come in to have a conversation about making an offer to an employee, what you should be mindful of, as well as talking about the fine print around recruiting, the do's and don'ts, what you might want to be uh, wary of or be aware of as you are making a commitment to someone that you're going to offer them employment. And of course, plenty of time for questions at the end. So please pop them in that question and answer uh, function, um, either now or as we get towards the end of the session. So headwinds, what context are we operating in? Um, I colloquially call this the doom and gloom slide because a lot of the context at the moment is not super, not super positive. So we'll start off by talking about the low immigration numbers that New Zealand is currently experiencing, which are very unusual for us. 
So we know that in 2022, we had a net gain of about 16,000 warm bodies in the country ready to do the work. Um, but that wiped out a net loss of 15,000 warm bodies leaving the country in 2021. Um, 2022, uh, sorry, 2020 is totally a, a write off year. We don't talk about 2020. Um, but for context, we know that between 2014 and 2019, um, on average, we had about 58,000 more people in the country to do the job that need doing. So not only do we not have that many humans coming into the country, um, we actually have people going. So for organisations who are used to, um, you know, bringing in the talent or the skills that their business requires from offshore, for people who are used to being able to plug the gaps with, with skilled migrant labour or unskilled migrant labour, um, those avenues are no longer available to us. We're having to make do with far fewer humans doing the work across the country, which is contributing to some of the, the labour shortages we're seeing at the moment. We know that labour costs are increasing. So the minimum wage increased 44% in the six years from 2017 to 2023. Um, I work in this space and I was really shocked to see those increases. I'd only feel like, you know, a dollar every year or so laid out as a 44% increase. Um, a rising tide doesn't always lift all boats at the remuneration space, but particularly if your business is operating at the, the lower end of the economy in terms of wages, someone who was getting $3 an hour more than their you know, brand new colleague a few years back and is now maybe only getting 50 cents more than them, um, understandably is going to want a bit of an increase. So it is getting more expensive to hire people. And one of the reasons for that has been um, the increase in the minimum wage over the last little while. No conversation in 2023, of course, would be complete without a discussion of the cost of living. So the consumer price, incre uh, consumer price index increased over the last year by 6.7% um, from the December to December year. So the quarter before the first quarter of this year, it was a 7.2% increase. So the scale of the ramp up is dropping off, but $100 no longer buys you the same amount of groceries as it did a year ago. Um, we know that this is likely to remain a squeeze for, for the most part, depending on what the Reserve Bank does with interest rates over the next little while. And there should be an announcement out, um, if not today, then tomorrow. But for the moment, it is costing us more to get around, to pay our rent, to, to buy groceries, to fill our car up and so on. All of this is against the backdrop, the, the backdrop of quite low unemployment numbers. So currently unemployment is sitting at 3.4%. Um, I had a look at the stats the other day and the last time it was this low was like pre-2015. So not only do we have fewer uh, people in the country doing the work who are more expensive and who want more money because it's more expensive for them to live and to, to, to pay their bills, um, we also have fewer people kind of looking for work. It, it's a bit of a compounding situation where um, it is expensive and hard and time consuming to, to find labour and to find staff at the moment. So those are all acute kind of pressures or acute factors that are influencing how it's all going right now. Um, something that I wanted to flag maybe more as something to mull on or just have at the back of your mind, uh, some changes to New Zealand's population demographics. So this long-term kind of chronic pressure is something that most developed economies are experiencing right now. But the issue is that at the moment, you know, we have a lot of data about post-65s and pre-65s because that's when superannuation kicks off. I'm not just bullying people in their mid-60s. Um, but at the moment, for every worker who's aged 65 and over, we have four workers who are under 65, um, which is a, a one to four ratio. That's pretty straightforward. In 20 years, that's going to be two to one. So for every worker who's aged 65 plus, we will have two workers of under 65. Um, that has implications for the tax base, right, in terms of the number of people working and earning and paying taxes to support the superannuation pay to, pay to our, um, our golden generation. It also has implications on uh, the recruitment tactics and strategies you might need to use if you have an operation or a business that requires fit and healthy workers, for example, or that requires people who have um, a particular familiarity with, with new technologies and new developments. Um, obviously, you know, a, a strong pair of legs and a strong back isn't the exclusive purview of people in their 20s, um, but certainly if you have manual labour in your organisation, you may need to have a think about how you staff going forward because there are going to be fewer workers under the age of 65 compared to um, an ageing population. So not something to think about today or tomorrow, but just a dynamic that's going to become uh, more, more prevalent, I think, in, in the years to come. 
So doom and gloom slide, a lot of going on. None of us can escape the fact that in New Zealand we have um, certain economic pressures and certain immigration trends that are affecting how easy it is to find staff. So we thought it would be um, a useful conversation to start talking about recruitment basics and the process of making sure you're getting best, best bang for your buck when you are recruiting, which starts with knowing what you want before you go looking. Um, if you've ever heard the saying, you know, don't go shopping when you're hungry because you just, you know, gorge yourself on treats and kind of carbohydrates and sugars and chocolate and snacks. Um, the same applies for when you are recruiting. If you are desperate to hire someone, if you're just under a lot of pressure to find the right person for the role, you will go to market and just settle for someone who's kind of good enough-ish or who looks like they might be okay because you're, you're desperate to bring them in. So taking a bit of time and thought, um, as Jasmine flagged earlier, to understand what it is that you want from a role and from a hire will reduce the chances of you just taking, um, taking someone who's close enough-ish for the role because you're desperate to find them. So have a job description prepared at bare minimum. Now, a job description describes the key tasks, uh, responsibilities, skills and experiences that are important for that job. Um, and they're mandatory to include in employment agreements. They're one of the 10 or 11 kind of critical, this must be in the employment agreement pieces required by law. So whether you need one, whether you have one at the start of your recruitment process or at the end, you are going to need one when you offer a job to someone. So it's better to have it upfront so you can be clear around um, for yourself, what you're looking for, but also for candidates, what they can expect from the role and what they can expect to be doing. We recommend keeping them short. Two to three pages is plenty. Um, often organisations who uh, respectfully are, are a touch more corporate uh, or who are coming from the public sector will have massive job descriptions that have all of the um, key relationships that someone might have, that have the KPIs for that role, which might have the salary banding, which might have the company or the organisation's values. Um, all of that information is important, but it shouldn't live in a job description, which is a contractual description and commitment to the work that the employee will do for you and the work that you'll be asking the employee to deliver. So two to three pages is, is totally fine. You can have um, quite broad descriptions in your, in your JD, so don't feel like you have to be super specific. Um, a couple of examples would be effectively manage a sales team to achieve growth targets, perfectly fine. Uh, design and implement new digital marketing initiatives, perfectly fine. It's not detailing how that's going to happen, but it's saying that this is the, the activity you'll be doing. And build and deliver vehicle trailers to the specifications provided. Again, perfectly, perfectly clear um, uh, point to have in a job description to explain what, what this person might be doing. We strongly recommend that you do not include specific KPIs in your job descriptions. Um, the reason, again, is that your job description forms a part of your employment agreement, which is a contractual agreement between you and your employee. Um, and if you want to change what's in an employment agreement, understandably, because it's a legal document, you may need to go through a consultation process with that employee, which is just a waste of time and, and silly when you're just saying, look, your sales target was 10% for this quarter. Um, we now know that we're in a recession, so we think that a 10% target is probably unrealistic. We want to change that to 5% um, as, as a target. Can we kind of go ahead and make that happen? That conversation is perfectly reasonable and, and perfectly sensible. Um, but if you, have an if you have that in an employment agreement, there's a whole process to go through and documentation to be required. So keep KPIs in your performance review process. If you're a MyHR member, you've got access to the performance review module, keep them in there, don't have them in your employment agreements because it's a, an admin hassle. And the last point to make too is that your job descriptions should be updated over time. Um, it's likely that as your business changes, as your person, as your employee's um, skill improves, as they start taking on different things, as you have new technologies or new systems at work, um, that their job year to year will look a bit different to the year it looked before. That's totally organic and, and totally natural. Um, what you want to be doing is building into your uh, business management processes a, a point or a reminder to check in with your JDs to make sure that they are updated. Um, the worst case scenario is that if you do need to make changes at some point, whether that's a restructure, whether it's um, uh, imposing changes on employees or consulting with them around different ways of doing things, if your job descriptions um, are not updated, it can be very confusing to understand who does what and where all of the work in the organization sits, particularly if you're larger or particularly if you're getting an external consultant to come in and help you with the changes like us. So my request on behalf of all my change management and all my HR and all my lawyer colleagues 
um, is please make sure that your job descriptions are updated so that um, one, you can recruit quickly, right? Because you've got updated documents, but also so that if you need to, to manage change, you've got a clear understanding of who does what and where that all sits in the business. So coming into specifically our recruitment conversation, um, recruitment is talked about as kind of an umbrella set of activities. Um, in the HR world, we tend to talk about attraction activities and selection activities. So everything that you do, which gets you the biggest pool of candidates and gets your vacancy out in the market is, is part of the attraction side of, of the recruitment coin. So what you're doing is you're being creative to get eyes on your brand, your vacancies and opportunities. Um, obviously, making sure that people know you're recruiting is kind of the first step. If people don't know that you have a vacancy, they want to apply for it. Um, but it's all the stuff that you would think of as typically kind of recruitment based. So posting job ads, whether that's on Seek or on Trade Me, or if you've got industry associations that you're a part of. Um, if you've got a careers page on your website that you're posting to, running social media campaigns, all of that kind of stuff is part of the attraction kind of set of activities. So again, the purpose is to attract people to apply for or be aware of your vacancy so that you have the biggest pool of people to choose from when you come to choosing who you're going to be offering the role to. Um, a quick word on social media campaigns. If you currently use social media in your recruitment process or if you're thinking about it, um, we know that the algorithms that Facebook and Instagram um, are using, I mean, other platforms too, but kind of mainly those two, um, are changing to prioritize video content, which is a bit of a consequence of TikTok um, showing up and blowing up over the last few years. So previously, if you, if you have a, a reasonably good social media audience, and if you were to post a vacancy and, and share that on your social media channel, that was, that was not unhelpful. Um, but at the moment, if there isn't video content that goes with it, it gets pushed way, way down the prioritization of content for your audience to see. Um, and particularly if you're a, a business or a page sharing things rather than like an individual, like Sylvie's LinkedIn profile versus the MyHR company profile. Um, if you're not paying to boost those posts, it's very unlikely that you will get um, meaningful engagement with them. So one, have a think about video content. And secondly, make sure that you're paying to play in the social media space. Um, it's how Facebook and Instagram make their money. They're very incentivized to make you pay to get your content in front of audiences. Um, so something to think about or just to be aware of if you do use social media in your recruitment process. Um, job fairs is something that we're seeing more of as we enter into a very squeezed um, talent market at the moment. And the example that I've, I've been sharing lately is we've got a series of um, hospitality clients who we, we work with and, and we provide advice to. Um, and several of them got together to host a, a job fair at a, a smaller convention center. So they um, pushed it out to all of their social media channels and they had I can't remember if it was 10 or 12, but a large number of organizations doing this, which meant they got way more attention and way more people coming to the jobs fair to talk about roles as front of house or to talk about roles in the kitchen or talk about roles in, um, in operations than if any one of them individually had gone out um, and, and tried to do the same thing. So getting creative and, and working, <laughs> working with your competitors for talent feels quite counterintuitive and feels like a weird suggestion, but basically anything that you can do to boost people's attention to and therefore chances of applying for your role, even if it means, you know, having slightly odd bedfellows in those attempts, um, at the moment is going to be something that you might want to consider if you're getting particularly creative. Um, the last thing here is a word on proactive search. So proactive search is when you go to either your LinkedIn account or your Seek account and you type in some uh, characteristics or some job titles that you're looking for and you try and find candidates who have those skills or experiences or criteria um, and you then kind of invite them to apply. Um, it's very much the, the realm of paid recruitment services. That's where that work typically happens when you have a, an agency recruiter um, that you've engaged. But we're seeing a lot of our smaller clients spend a bit more time tapping into their networks immediately or doing a bit of work with the Seek databases or with the LinkedIn um, uh, search tools to go and try and find candidates. So if you uh, have been used to putting up an ad, seeing who applies, and then kind of dealing with your candidates from there, um, it might be something to think about trying more proactive search if that has something you haven't tried before or if you've got a really niche role that isn't, isn't really working for you right now. Um, it obviously takes time and investment, which is why the recruiters charge the big bucks for it. Um, but certainly something to think about now that we have more accessible 
um, databases and have more access to, to places like LinkedIn and Seek if that's somewhere that your candidates are likely um, are likely to exist. So we move on to talking about selection. So having um, got as, as big a pool of candidates as we can possibly have, there are all these humans who are interested in, a, in applying for the role. We now are talking about how we choose from that pool of candidates to um, progress through the steps of the recruitment process or to offer a role. So the purpose of any selection process is to predict who will be successful in the role, right? We want to know who's going to show up, do a good job, not be a dickhead, be reliable, get things done and kind of be a cool member of the team. That's what we're looking for. So the tools that we have are things that you will, all, will should all feel pretty familiar with. So CV screening, um, phone and face-to-face -face interviews, psychometric testing, which can include um, personality profiling. So who are you? And then ability tests like verbal and numerical, what can you do tests. Um, and things like reference checking. So the purpose of all of these tools is to try and get an understanding of, is this person likely to succeed in this job? Because I want to pick someone who's going to be awesome, not someone who's going to be shit, because it's a waste of time. What is um, interesting to, to talk about and to understand is that these tools have different, um, the, the stats language is predictive validity, right? These tools are more and less good at predicting who is going to be successful in a role. So we um, went to the research to see what um, the academics can tell us about which of these tools are most useful, right? Um, recruitment is expensive. It's very time consuming. There is a lot of um, business and commercial commitment and investment in learning and understanding which of these tools are more or less useful. And there's a lot of academics who are very keen to do research on, on, on what that might look like. So the selection tools that we um, got into are these ones here as being most predictive. So the research I'm about to talk about comes from 2001. Um, there was another meta study from about 2004 that lined up with the figures that I'm about to share. Um, but what I found really interesting was that none of this research is from particularly recent because the research over the 80s and 90s was so compelling. Like we have answered the question of what tools are most likely to predict success at work. It's not an interesting research question anymore, but we've got this one figured out. So um, although I was looking and, you know, Jazz and I had conversations about trying to find something from like at least the 2010s rather than 22 years ago, um, all of the research kind of sort of reached a natural end point because we, we know what's most predictive of success at work. So the um, range of predictive validity, this is getting a bit more stats heavy than you expected. I'll move through this as quickly as I can. Um, if a tool has a predictive validity of one, it is perfectly good at predicting success or, or failure at work. So 100% of the time, it would predict who was successful and who wasn't. So that's, that's a one. A zero means it is no better than random. So a, a rating of zero is bad. It's not useful for predicting success at work. A rating of one means it is perfectly predictive of who is successful and who is not at work. Um, obviously, no tool ever hits perfection. Otherwise, HR people wouldn't have a job. Um, but the closer we can get to one, the, the more confident we can be that we have <clears throat> done our best to predict a candidate's success or, or lack of at work. So... Um, cognitive ability and integrity assessments are the most predictive at 0 0.65. Um, an integrity assessment is a tool that looks at and measures basically your conscientiousness, like how likely are you to do the right thing? How likely are you to behave in ways that are um, good for the organization, kind of organizational citizenship stuff? Um, second below that are cognitive ability and structured interview testing at 0.63. That's pretty good. That's up there. Next, uh, cognitive ability and work samples. So a work sample is getting someone to come in and make you a coffee if they're a barista or um, balance, balance your books if they're going to be an accountant or um, speak to customers on the phone if they're going to be in customer service. So anything that, that gets them to do what the tasks actually will be in their job. And then we drop down to just work samples, 0.54 predictive, just cognitive ability and just structured interviews. So if you are using structured interviews currently in your recruitment process, um, you should be very, very pleased that you are using a tool that is among the best at predicting how successful someone is going to be or isn't going to be at work. 
Um, cognitive ability and psychometric testing in New Zealand in particular isn't as common. Um, it certainly is if you are recruiting in bulk. So any of the graduate programs for the banks or, you know, the big four accounting firms will use them. Um, but it's not common in kind of smaller organizations. So not, not something that we that we see a lot of. Um, and I also thought it would be interesting to share the information about um, the selection tools that we that we have here. So the selection tools that are not that predictive of candidate success are these ones here. So references, I was shocked to see <laughs> as an HR person who's been a recruiter, they're only 0.26 predictive of success. So they're better than random, they're better than zero, but they're not particularly useful for, um, for predicting this kind of information. Years of job experience is even worse. So it's better than random, but years of job experience actually is not that predictive of how successful someone will or won't be in a job. Same with their personal interests, same with their years of education. As someone who went to university, I was mortally offended by this. Um, graphology, so handwriting, obviously not that predictive. Um, and someone's age is, is has a, a slight inverse uh, value. So it's, it's better than random, but the older you get, the very, very slightly less chance there is of you being as successful at work, I'm sorry to say, for all of us. So structured interviews, good if you're relying on years of education or years of job experience, um, not so useful for, for predicting how this is going to go. So very interesting. If you have any uh, questions about this, you're welcome to pop them through. But for now, I will jump into our next slide and I will hand over to Jasmine to take over from here. So Jasmine, over to you and I will uh, continue to man, man the, um, the slideshow as we get through things. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Okay, guys, so now that we've selected our top pool, our favourite candidates, um, now is the time for us to start narrowing down that pool. Um, so if you just wanted to um, go through the slide there for me, Sylvie. Um, yeah, so what, once we've narrowed down that pool, um, we basically want to be looking at, you know, our interview structure and how we might want to conduct that interview with that particular person. Um, interviews are still our most popular way of interviewing somebody, whether it's face-to-face -face or online on video calls. Um, a way that you may want to structure your interview process um, is looking at potentially planning it out on paper, um, starting with, say, an introduction, um, you know, provide an opportunity for you to discuss any relevant business information for that candidate. Um, and then asking your prepared questions to that candidate, um, which will then give them an opportunity to um, ask you questions and uh, be themselves and yeah, give them that definitely the clear um, expectation of, of what to expect in the position and, and moving forward. Um, we've also got, uh, you know, the past behaviour is also a best predictor uh, for the future. So asking those behavioural questions as well. And we've got a couple of examples here where you could, you know, ask specifically, Tell me about a time when you had to complete a task that required excellent attention to detail um, and how did you make sure your work was accurate? Um, or another example of, give me an example of when you had to deal with a particular difficult customer um, or a difficult person in the business and how did you respond to that? What was the outcome? Um, one that I really like as well in particular is, you know, describe me a time when potentially you've made a mistake and how um, did you work through that? And then that way you're able to see really, you know, them showing ownership um, as well and also integrity. And I think those are two really important qualities to look for. Um, and yeah, being aware of common biases that might affect your thinking. I think, you know, we all can be a little bit guilty um, of these types of things. And so, a couple of examples here, uh, you know, maybe a like me bias of like, hey, I've got some common interests of that person or I think, oh, that person seems a little bit like me or you think they are like you. Um, and then we've also got, say, the halo um, or, or the horns effect where maybe they've given you a, a positive impression and you're leading with that in a favourable manner or 
maybe they've given you a negative impression and you are grasping onto that and it's giving you a negative perspective on that person. Um, I guess you've also got the beauty biased of whether someone's attractive or not so attractive. It's not very nice. Um, and then confirmation bias as well um, of, you know, your initial perception of somebody um, and kind of having an initial thought uh, in your head and you're particularly just focusing on that area. Um, and our final point here is basically making sure that the candidate is most the talking. So, you know, you want them to show who they are, be themselves and um, show you what they've got. And so you want to, you know, give them a good part of the floor there to, um, to give you that information. All right. So we've also got reference checking, which can be quite a complex um, area, um, but it also is super, super helpful. Now, in my experience, I've noticed where reference checking hasn't actually been conducted and how much that has had an impact in the, you know, the employment relationship where the person hasn't cut out to be the person that you thought they were. Um, and it could have simply been, you know, making that phone call or doing a little bit of a, a background work and looking into those references. And so definitely reference checks are helpful for sure. Um, and, you know, recommending um, using them to definitely understand that, that person a bit more. Um, not so much a, a dual break, but more a, a good element to consider definitely when um, screening your candidates for sure. Um, you know, when we are going through the referencing process um, and when we are calling those references, we do want to be mindful of the questions that we are asking um, those referees and being quite clear in terms of, you know, what do you think of this person? What's your experience maybe managing this person? Um, to get a clear idea of who they are, what they are like in practice. Um, and then we've got some clear, you know, useful questions here that you might want to use of, you know, how did they, how do they react to feedback, uh, positive or negative, um, whether it's constructive feedback, um, are they reacting to that in a negative manner or are they able to take that on board and improve? Um, was there any conflict at work? Were they involved in that conflict? Um, would you hire them again? Um, if not, what are the reasons um, that you wouldn't hire them again? Or, you know, what are the positive reasons that, you know, you would hire them again? Um, and then lastly, you know, Definitely, my HR clients are provided um, with reference checking tools during the onboarding process. So we can definitely support you in that manner. And especially you've got a great new onboarding system as well as part of your my business space that you could also include um, as part of your a part of your recruitment and onboarding process. All right. And so here we are getting to the bit more exciting part of actually making the offer. Um, so you've, you've found your favorite person, you think they're going to be epic for the position um, and you would like to make the offer to them. Now we can get a little bit too excited and we might make a verbal offer to that person um, and something may not turn out perfectly moving forward and we're wanting to potentially say withdraw that offer. We need to think, oh, you know, we've made that verbal offer. Okay, they accept it on their behalf. So we need to be mindful as well that when we are making that verbal offer, whether it's verbal or written, it's legally binding. So, um, you know, if it's helpful, taking a step back and making sure that that is the person that you are wanting to make that offer to initially. Um, once they accept it, awesome. Um, and, you know, that they have the complete intention that they are expecting to work um, either the next day or, or, or when you've discussed. Um, we want to ensure that we are including our nicely written out job description um, with our employment agreement as well as those are two 
legally required um, document that would be important for us to include in that offer. Um, and these will specifically be outlined the terms and conditions that we will be providing um, this candidate. So that is clear um, of, of what we're expecting and what we are needing from them as well. And that may be specific terms and conditions of their actual employment offer. And so when we're looking at that, we may want to be including some type of subject to, uh, you know, a, a valid work visa, a satisfactory reference check, um, maybe it's a clean full driver's license, um, a, a clean drug and alcohol pre-employment check. Um, these are quite important aspects that we may want to be thinking about as well prior to that employment relationship actually commencing. And so one of my strongly advised points is to make sure that those are clearly outlined in the letter of offer. Um, and that way it's super, super clear. Um, and, you know, we, we know what the expectations are moving forward if we, if unfortunately any of those points have come back unsatisfactory. Perfect. Okay. And so the not so fun stuff, the bit more serious stuff, um, you know, the fine print. So the legal do's and don'ts and the things that we may not naturally, um, you know, want to think about, um, but it's important that we are mindful of, of these points is, you know, definitely do ask for a completed application form um, along with copies of relevant documents um, such as the right to work, um, qualifications or licences. And so these will be quite specific probably to the industry that you are in and the particular position as well. Um, but it's important to think about those points, especially, I guess it comes back to my point on the letter of offer and having those specific terms in there um, so that you, you, you've got the right candidate essentially. Um, another awesome do is can you explain um, that the terms and conditions during your recruitment process um, are clear? So, you know, we, we want to have those basics in there um, of location, their pay range, typical hours of work that they can expect to be working, um, whether there's going to be a trial or a probation period included in there. And these are areas that may raise, say, questions, whether it's at the beginning of the relationship or throughout the duration. And it's good to have that specific black and white information in there to draw back to of what was originally agreed. Um, we have got, you know, expect to be asked questions about the job, the team, the organisation. And, you know, I guess also thinking about that initial interview process of where we, you know, might have given a little bit of an introduction originally uh, to the candidate and gave them a little bit of information about us already. But, you know, we might want to also make sure we're doing that throughout the process right to the end um, to make sure that there's no hidden surprises. All right. And, you know, we don't want to be asking illegal or inappropriate questions, um, especially questions that may come across as discriminatory or against, say, one person's human rights. And so those might include, like, say, for example, a good, a, a good example is, do you have any commitments outside of work that might affect your ability to work the hours required? I think that's relatively fine to ask. Um, but we don't want to be asking questions like, do you have kids? Are you pregnant? Are you planning to be pregnant? Are you a churchgoer? You know, or asking those more personal questions or around age, um, sex and, and that. So, yeah, we want to avoid that terminology for sure. Um, now, this kind of comes back to my point of that verbal agreement that we may be excited um, to make. Um, we just want to be, I guess, mindful that when we are in a situation where we want to withdraw an offer, whether it's, say, that person has unsatisfactorily met conditions of our employment offer, or we just end up not really 
liking the person. Um, we we do want to definitely reach out um, to the advice team and we can you know, knuckle into that issue that you may be um, wanting to manage. Um, if, if it is something where someone hasn't successfully met the conditions of the employment offer and it's clearly outlined in the letter of offer, that's a pretty straightforward process. It's pretty clear that they haven't met the expectations um, of that position. And so we can confidently say, you know, hey, you haven't... Um, Meet, meet these requirements and so therefore we wish, we wish to withdraw this offer of employment um if it's a situation where we don't have that specific information um it's probably best as I say to reach out to the team and we can see um what we can do and support you maybe through a consultation process potentially nice one Thank you, Jasmine. It's uh, always lovely to have a company on these on these sessions <laughs> and good to get some, a different perspective as yeah. well. Um, yeah. As flagged, everyone, we now have plenty of time for questions. We're at 1.41 p.m. So I'll give you a few minutes to type and talk through if there is something in there that, you, um, that you'd like to get myself or Jasmine to comment on. What I'll do is I'll just stop sharing so you can get um, our full beautiful faces as we go through this discussion. So um, Liz has asked a question about that research I mentioned earlier about the um, selection process. Kia ora, Liz, thank you for joining us. Um, she's asked, how was success at a job defined for that research? Excellent question. So that particular 2001 study I mentioned was a meta-analysis of dozens of other studies that looked at the predictive uh, validity of different selection tools. And they all had varying because there's you know dozens of studies they had varying definitions of success the majority of them and what that meta-analysis tried to do was to say well if either your um, supervisor your colleagues or your business results point to success that is what we're counting so the short answer is there were different measures of success that were considered which included um, like supervisors assessments of whether Sylvie is or isn't good at her job they included colleagues feedback about whether we all think Jasmine's good at her job um, and there was there was um, a few that included content around um, like the metrics and output particularly in more transactional industries like call centers and um, and production so different metrics involved but yeah there was um mostly around kind of feedback or what, whether your output was considered good for, for the role or industry you were in. Great question. Thank you. Um, Anonymous has commented regarding population growth needed to cover retired workers. Some parts of the world are projected to have massive population growth in coming years. So it would make sense for other countries to encourage people from those countries to immigrate. Um, Anonymous, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's a really interesting point, um, which certainly informs the immigration policies of the more the more developed economies around the world. Um, but certainly as we have, a, as, as, as us and other developed uh, countries have more aging populations, there's going to be um, some very interesting conversations about how we fill those gaps in our in our labour market, um, which isn't, which, which can't just be everyone have more babies. There needs to be more, more thoughtful solutions than that. Um, Jazz, this question's for you, or I'm going to point it to you. Um, yeah. Anonymous asks, how much time would you expect a candidate to spend preparing for an assessment task? For example, asking them to do a presentation for their second interview. What would be reasonable here? Well, you know, I think maybe asking the candidate you know, that could be a good start seeing, you know, hey, look, we would really love um, to meet with you for a second interview. Um, we would also really enjoy if you were able to, you know, say, present a certain task or conduct a certain, uh, complete a certain assessment um, and seeing what time frame works for them. You might want to be a little bit flexible. Um, I don't think there's a rule um, or, you know, a specific time frame that you have to meet. It could be the next day or it could be the next couple of days or the following week. Um, I think what best suits for you um, and the candidate for sure. Yeah. Anonymous asks, can you clarify not being able to ask if a candidate has out-of-work interests which may affect their ability to work the nominated hours? That sounds like a fairly important point to know before hiring someone. Yeah, good question. And that might have been the way that, that we explained that. So just to clarify, 
you can say, do you have any out of work commitments that might affect your ability to do this job, whether that's work the hours or whether that's, you know, be available on weekends for call out or whatever it might be. That question is fine to ask. What's not okay to ask is, do you have kids? Because whether someone does or doesn't have kids doesn't actually necessarily mean they will or won't be able to make keep the working hours. Um, don't ask them about their faith activities. Don't ask them about kind of their union activities. Um, just be, be be pretty straightforward and say, do you have any commitments that might affect your ability to work these hours? Um, and then that will cover all your bases. Because if you ask if someone has kids and they say no and you assume that they will be available, maybe they have uh, commitments to community groups or to other activities in their life that you missed because you didn't ask that question but which are actually going to cause the problem in their um, in their availability. So you can ask about that just to be clear. Um, Jazz, question for you. Um, Abby, kia ora Abby, thank you for joining us. Hi Abby. Is, are there any specific benefits included in a remuneration package that you're seeing as a great tool of attraction lately? Oh, this is an exciting one. Um, Gosh, I feel like there's a whole raft of benefits now that have been offered or at least been tested. Um, I think what is quite hot at the moment is a really good um, maybe parental leave um, type package. Um, I guess that's something for your, your employees as a whole, but not so much the initial remuneration package for an employment offer to think about. Um but, you know, maybe it's a good, you know, yearly bonus or, um, you know, I guess there's quite, quite a few different examples, isn't there, Sylvie, of what we're saying? Not so much in, like, as a clause, a, you know, in an employment agreement, but I think our overall company policies are becoming a lot more um, popular um, th that fall under everybody as opposed to, a, you know, a specific employee's package. Yeah, totally. And just to add to that, um, Abby, we have a report that's coming out at the end of July or the start of August where we have asked that question of about 400 different businesses to say, what are the benefits that you do offer to your employees? And the one that has come out on top is flexible working hours. Um, I think it's about, I'm going to get this wrong, and you'll, uh, you'll, you'll email me in a month and say, so where this math doesn't work out. But something like 60% of the companies that we surveyed do provide flexible working arrangements as a benefit to their employees. Um, so we'll have more data and be sharing more information about that in the weeks to come if you'd like to keep an eye on your, uh, your emails and your communications from us. Um, Jazz, question for you from Michelle. Kia ora, Michelle. What would you do if you had one really positive reference check and one bad reference check for the same candidate? Would you do a third one or how would you deal with that situation? I would totally do the third one. So, you know, the more the merrier maybe. Um, so definitely I wouldn't stop at the first um, positive reference check. Um, but I also wouldn't stop maybe after one bad if we've also got one good. So, you know, if we've got a little bit of an unusual situation where it's a little bit of a mixed bag, I would definitely go for the third reference and see whether there's, you know, any kind of understanding or any more information that we could gather um, to shed some light on maybe that more negative one. Yeah, totally. And I think it's a question of context as well. Like if the employee or if the candidate early in the recruitment process flagged to you and said, look, I, I had a bit of a tense relationship with this manager. Here's what kind of happened. They're one of my references, but it might come up. Um, and then it does come up. I, the fact that they flagged it with you and were self-aware enough to know that it was going to be a bit of a, a tense reference um, to me would be a, a positive attribute. So I don't think, and, and I would agree with, with Jazz in saying, I don't think a negative reference is a showstopper. It's one piece of information along with all of the pieces of information you've got about this person. Um, and it might just be something to, to keep an eye on or to build into their onboarding plan if there's a particular behavior or a particular skill or a particular situation that you'd be, um, you'd be a, bit, a bit mindful of. Definitely. Um, Eleanor, kia ora Eleanor, um, has, says, has said, don't forget to do a quick Google check. It's low time and effort. Then if it raises anything of interest or concern, check in with the person. Yeah, I totally agree, Eleanor. I think um, <laughs> as long as you're having a conversation with them to say, hey, I, we, we've done a bit of a, a check on the online. It's part of our recruitment process. Um, these photos of you came up, you know, 
smoking some questionable materials or, or behaving in a way that is a, is, doesn't quite like with our company values. Um, can we have a chat about what that situation is and, and what um, what behaviour that was? Um, yeah, totally fine. The, the key piece is to talk to them about it, not to decide that because they went to Splore and had a pretty wild weekend three years ago, mm-hmm. that they're not going to be a good employee. I wouldn't encourage that, um, but definitely something to, to discuss with them. And then I'll take this one. Anonymous asks, if you have a trial as part of the interview, for example, doing a half day test of a certain skill, does this need to be paid? Um, excellent question, Anonymous. Thank you for asking. So you can um, you can ask the, empl- the candidate to do any activity that's kind of reasonable as long as the purpose is to assess their suitability for the role. So if at the end of um, a work sample where they came in, maybe they fake answered some emails and they did like a role play with a colleague on how they deal with a difficult customer, as long as it's clear that those are um, activities intended to assess how suitable for the role they are, and the, the candidate knows that and it's cl- it's clearly a recruitment activity, um, no, you don't need to pay them for that. That's not the expectation. Um, however, where a role um, is more hands-on, like a, a barista or a mechanic or a florist maybe, um, you need to be really, really careful that any um, work sample type activities you get them to do um, don't add commercial value to the business and, and why that is will become clearer in a second. So if you have a barista who comes in and you say, cool, can you make me um, a flat white, a skinny mocha and a long black and they, they make the coffees for you. Um, those coffees can't be given to customers. They either need to be thrown out or like drunk by the, the front of house staff or, or, or drunk by the kitchen staff. Because if a person does something for you, does work or does an activity that you get commercial benefit from, like the dollar that you're going to get from on selling those coffees, that is an employment relationship. And you now can't fire them because they are an employee. Like there is the establishment of a working relationship. So if you um, owned a floristry business and got a florist to come in and they were your final candidate, you just wanted to check a few things and you said, oh, look, we've had a customer order come in for a bouquet that is fresh and funky with bright colors. Can you show me what you would make? If they make you that bouquet and you go, man, that was a rocking bouquet. I love that. And you, you sell it and send it to the customer. They have done work for you. There is an employment relationship there. So the short answer is, we would strongly recommend that you do not pay for work trials because that immediately, like the fact that you've paid them money establishes a working relationship. And even before you get to the, did you pay them threshold, if they did work for you that you got a commercial value from selling the florist or selling the coffees, that also establishes a working relationship. So um, assessments, totally fine. Trials, mostly fine. As long as it's clear that the purpose is to assess their skill for the role. And as long as the result of that workplace trial, um, you basically don't sell or don't get a commercial benefit from. So I hope that's answered your question. Cool. Uh, Jazz, a question for you. Liz asks, is there a standard question, quote, do you have any medical conditions which may affect your ability to fulfill the job duties? Yeah, it's not uncommon to ask for, say, a pre-employment medical check. Um, And it might depend on the position as well. So, like, if it's, you know, maybe in construction or somewhere where they're physically needing to be able um, to do a role, um, then that's where it might be necessary. So, I think when it is appropriate, um, it's okay um, to ask for that information. And that might be from their doctor and uh, directly as well. Um, and that is a really good um, question to have or like a condition to have in your employment offer too is a satisfactory medical report or, you know, a medica- m- medical check um, prior uh, to that offer being accepted. Yeah, Especially where that physical level of fitness is important, right? Or you're going to be working in a hazardous environment. And so you need a a start point to go, well, your lung capacity was this, and now you've been working with, you know, construction or with dust for 10 years. And and now you're saying that your work has hurt you. We've got that checkpoint 10 years ago, and now we can do another Mm -hmm. lung assessment to check that. Um, I'd add to that, Liz, that on the application form that MyHR provides our clients as a, as a standard when they first sign up to our services. Um, there is a question, are there any kind of medical or health issues which would affect you from preventing your, from, from filling the duties of your role? 
And that can include things like um, dyslexia. It can include things like ADHD. It can include things like a diagnosed mental health condition that they might need occasional support for. So yeah, it, it's fine to ask that as long as you then don't discriminate because they have disclosed that they, for example, would be undergoing um, gender transition or gender assignment surgery. Um, if you went, well, I don't like trans people. Oh, gross, I'm not going to hire that person. That's obviously discriminatory. Don't do that. But if it's to understand um, what might be required to support them at work, like someone with dyslexia is going to obviously need different support to someone without, um, totally fine in those circumstances. Cool. Um, Alex says, kia ora, Alex, thank you for joining us. Um, if you go through the interview process and then you hire the person, then later you find out that they've lied or misled you, can you end their employment? Um, Alex, the answer is it depends on what's in the employment agreement. And as long as you have a, a piece that says um, serious misconduct includes um, withholding information during the recruitment process or supplying information that is untrue or misleading, um, then yes, you'll be able to terminate them for, for lying to or misleading you during the recruitment piece. Um, that's, again, a standard piece that we supply to all of our clients in the employment agreements we provide. Um, when employees sign their employment agreement, there's a special declaration section which says, I have been truthful during the recruitment process and have not supplied misleading or withheld important information. Um, so yes, as long as that's documented, um, you can end someone's employment. Cool. Uh, Jad's a question for you. Stephen, kia ora mm. Stephen, thanks for coming along with us. Hello. Says, what would be the ideal length for an interview? Is there an advantage to having multiple interviewers sitting in over a one-on-one -on -one interview? So two questions, what's the ideal length and what would be the ideal number of interviewers to have in on an interview? That's a really, really good question. You know, ideal length, probably not like no longer if you wanted to get to specifics, like say 20 to 30 minutes. You don't want it to be too long, but then at the same time, you do want to be able to get the most out of that interview that you can um, and, and use that time wisely. So at the same time, I'd say go with the flow, but also I think that comes into your structure and making sure that you're ticking off those points that you are really wanting to, I guess, address in that one interview and then also going with the flow of how naturally the conversation might might go um so again no specific right or wrong time but you know I think you can get a vibe of whether things are dragging out a bit or or maybe not so much um with I guess your other question I think two is really helpful because you're getting two different perspectives. So you have two different people, two different minds, um, able to have an opinion and a perspective on that person. So I think that's really helpful when you're going back to the drawing board and assessing um, who may be the best fit um, amongst those candidates. Yeah. Anonymous asks, can you ask someone to come in and spend a couple of hours in the business, get to know the team, um, but not do any actual work? So it's not a physical trial, more of a meet and greet for the team. Um, my perspective on that is I would ask what value you expect to get out of that session. Um, we know that humans have a lot of biases. It's, it's a feature of how we're built. It's not a bug. All of us have a natural preference for people who are more like us rather than less like us. We have a natural preference for people who are, are better looking than not, which are the, the biases that Jasmine pointed out earlier, and there are many others. So if you brought a candidate in who um, did not fit the mould of your team or who did not um, share a lot of features or experiences or interests in common with your team, um, potentially your team would go, there wasn't a vibe, we kind of didn't click, like there they're a rugby league fan, we're a rugby union fans, like, you know, it's not a good fit. Um, and actually that isn't, we don't, we, we know that that's not predictive of how successful they would be at work. It's predictive of how much your team immediately like them, but that is not a factor that predicts kind of success at work in an ongoing capacity. So um, uh, my advice would not be not to do it, but just to think about why you are wanting to bring them in and to be mindful that someone who, immediately clicks and gels with the team. Um, that tells you that they immediately click and gel with the team. It doesn't tell you about a lot of other things that are potentially more important to how they will perform and how they will go in their role. 
So we've come up to two o'clock. There is one last question, which very conveniently dovetails with one that we talked about earlier. Um, Annabelle, kia ora Annabelle, asks, if someone answers a question in an interview that may not be true and you don't find this out until after you hire them, how do you handle this? Um, similar to, to my answer to um, one of our colleagues, one of our participants earlier was, if that is accounted for in your employment agreement, so if, if lying during the recruitment process is serious misconduct, yes, you can fire them and move them on and that's, um, that's reasonably straightforward. So somewhat unusually, we've got through all the questions in our time. So thank you to everyone who put a question through and uh, for showing up and coming along today. Um, Jasmine, thank you for being a wonderful co-host. I look forward to doing more of these with you in the future. Um, again, there'll be a recording of the session that's available afterwards. So keep an eye on your emails over the next few days. Um, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to understand more about recruiting in your business, or if you would like to understand more about my HR and how we support our clients in this space, um, please get in touch. We're at help at myhr.works or give us a call if you're in New Zealand on 0800 69 4769. But until then, have a wonderful afternoon and long weekend and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See ya.